Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Funderburg Hoffman. I am the executive director of the Alliance. Look at me. <laughs> Artist Communities Alliance, also known as ATA. Welcome to our new name and welcome to our Zoom room today. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm calling you today from calling in from Providence, Rhode Island, the sacred lands of the Narragansett, Neantic, and Wampanoag. I invite you to acknowledge the sacred lands around you. We acknowledge the past, present, and the future generations of these nations that were and continue to be denied free and unhindered access to their land, which fundamentally shapes their identity and spirituality. I pay respects to the Narragansett, Neantic, and Wampanoag peoples and all other nations whose lands we occupy. As we are gathered here in community, I wanna take a moment and ask you all to join me in a moment of reflection to honor all of the black lives lost, known and unknown, lost at the hands of police and state, at the hands of this system and their structures and their every manifestation. I invite you to acknowledge the harm, violence and trauma of this white body supremacy. And with that, I also invite you to hold space and gratitude for the brilliance, joy, wisdom, care and the love. Let's hold for uh, just a moment of silence. I wanna thank you all again for sharing this space with us. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the ACA team. ACA, Miranda just, you know, I always say, ah, ACA, but stay with me. Uh, the ACA team on this call, Candace Hemphill, Flannery Patton, Deb Dormady, Miranda Miller, and Edwin Charlot. I'm grateful to my colleagues and their commitment, generosity, and grace that they bring to this work. And as many of you have experienced over the past 19 months, they have been thoughtful stewards of this process and bringing online an incredible learning experiences uh, to all of you in very different formats. This session is ASL interpreted. Our interpreters today are Leslie and Victor and captioning is provided by Marsha. And I also like to acknowledge you all, all of our guests. Um, we have a really beautiful and wonderful and exciting session lined up today. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of our session and, and what we'll go through. But before we get started, I'd like to take a little space and hold a little space for some ground rules, rules of engagement, and some Zoom keeping. I want you all to first remember and hold throughout this session that we're all experiencing this moment differently. We must be respectful of the valuable commodity of time. We are uh, really hoping to keep this open and engaging and there'll be a time for you to participate and uh, to bring your questions into the space. So just be thoughtful of that. Please address your experience, experiences from an I experience and avoid speaking on behalf of others. Um, I think that's really important in terms of a reflection point and, and thinking about who you're speaking for and on behalf of. Please keep the specific topic and questions in mind. We're gonna do our best to avoid alphabet soup and coded language by unpacking acronyms or buzzwords. One thing that we have learned throughout this strategic planning process is that precision is important, important. And then second to that, we are also trying to be extraordinarily mindful of using jargon or words that have been overused, especially over the past three or four years and avoid some of the abstractification that comes with that. We'll address that a little bit more in the conversation. Um, I'm gonna ask that you honor the code of silence. Please take the lessons, but leave the details here. Practice chat box etiquette. Use the private chat function uh, as necessary, but again, we'll have it so that you will not be able to chat and uh, have a lot of fodder in the space, but you'll be able to communicate directly with the co-host. So please, please be mindful of how that's being used. Um, at the end of each session, we invite you to add your contact information to the chat box if you wish to have it shared with other uh, participants. 
And as always, we'll be sharing our notes, links, and resources in a recording after this session. I'd like to add to this, um, we do our best to operate from a place of care. Uh, we really understand that everyone is expending, is, is experiencing this moment and past moments differently. So with that, we know that this conversation is nothing but a conversation and no one conversation can cover all the things that need to be covered. So um, I ask that you keep that in mind and just recognize in this moment, we are doing our best to build our collective capacity to do our best work. And while we know this session is open to anyone, we have invited anyone and everyone who wishes to attend, um, the artist experience is also very different than EDs, uh, board members, staff, arts administrations. And we also acknowledge that in their respective roles as executive directors, board members, and staff, in terms of an artist residency experience, that there is not always asymmetrical power. With that, I wanna make sure all of our artists on the call recognize that we will be having a separate artist listening session where we'll be able to unpack, think about the strategic plan, and also bring forward the questions, concerns, the feedback that you have about improving the conditions and the climates of artist residency programs so that you can continue to participate and find joy in, in that space. Um, that date, just, just for reference, is December 9th. We do have a date on that calendar and I, I didn't wanna leave that off, but it'll be a late fall date. December 9th, and please uh, keep an eye out on your emails for that. It's a proven fact that artists of all mediums and methods are an integral part of our communities. They provide us with inspiration, solace, helping us to understand the past, cope with the present, and imagine the future. They energize our communities both economically and socially, but to play this pivotal role in society, we have also known as residency operators, arts administrators, executive directors, board members, volunteers, and supporters, that they also need support structures that allow them to live and create. So it's no wonder that I turn to an artist during this time of strategic planning and visioning that has been somewhat my guide and my muse throughout this whole process. Many of you here have heard me before reference the Irish poet David White. And I feel like he and I have been having this long meandering conversation for a few, few years now. And to be quite honest, I've never met him a day in my life. <laughs> he has never met me, but he has been as much of a friend to me as any of my closest and very best friends. And I'm not sure that we would have arrived here at this place without him. So with that, I'll bring him into this space and then we'll get started. I'd like to read a passage. It's actually a very short conclusion, uh, a footnote in one of his books called The Three Marriages. And The Three Marriages is a book where he talks about reimagining re work, self, and relationship. And David wrote this book after giving a talk, after doing a week of really wonderful talks in South Africa, and he said that he came to the podium, his last talk, he had been invited by this uh, very rich and uh, wonderful banker, and they've had wine, great conversation, seminars and lectures, and a half, hour, half an hour before the talk, he had no idea what he would say. And he talked often about how me meandering through a conversation, that, that's how he gets to where he lands. It's his spoken word and, and he writes, that is how he navigates these situations. And at this point, at the start of this conversation, he had no idea what he was going to say. And he talks very beautifully about that half hour leading up to where he stands before the podium. Having found myself there many of time, um, I felt like, I was like, yeah, David, what'd you do? So um, I, as I was reading through this book and listening, I came to this passage and it made me really think about what is the opportunity for a strategic planning process. And I'd like to share this with you. He says, happiness in the second marriage of work, like happiness in the first marriage with a person is possible only through seeing it in a greater context than surviving the everyday. 
We must have relationship with our work that is larger than any individual job description we are given. A real work, like a real person, grows and changes and surprises us, asking us constantly for recommitment. In work, we have often made secret vows. Sometimes we do not know ourselves what those vows are until we look back with some perspective on the actual nature of the work we have accomplished. And here we are today. We're gonna look back on the work that we have accomplished as Artist Communities Alliance and bringing forth this new brand identity, this new strategic plan. And in the words of Rob Bayless, one of our um, wonderful board members, a dramatic repositioning of Artist Communities Alliance. And we would just love to share a little bit of our experience with you. So with that, I'd love to introduce our panelists. I am not going to read those bios because they are in your packet and we're anxious to get into those conversations. But um, our first starting off with our strategic planning consultant, my dear friend, um, also my muse and extraordinary partner in this process over the past two years, Jennifer Shropshire. Say hi, Jennifer. Hi, good to uh, see everyone. Good to see you, Melissa Franklin. Uh, one of our board member extraordinaires who also has been a great friend and colleague over the years. Uh, we met when I actually was on the Alliance board and now has been uh, actually one of our longer tenured board members. Hi, Melissa. Um, I'd like to introduce Mario Garcia Durham, who is our current board chair of Artist Communities Alliance, um, a wonderful mentor, uh, just a person who has had extraordinary depth of field uh, of experience and wisdom in the field and has been uh, a great camp companion and colleague in this work. Hi, Mario. And Sanjeet Sethi, who's our incoming board chair um, and another great friend, great thinker and brilliant mind who was uh, really critical in stewarding this process and, and bringing our strategic visioning process to life. Hi, Sanjeet. Hello. So with that, we're gonna get started. And typical of our conversations, uh, this conversation, I, I always have, and those of you who have been here with me before, I have a list of questions and then we go off topic and then I'll call on someone from the actual audience and then the staff will throw their hands up and say, here she goes. And we'll have this great, wonderful, beautiful conversation um, as it should be, unscripted, informal, and um, vulnerable and open to anything that it could be. So Jennifer, I want to start with you. Um, you and I met, I think, about three or four years ago when we hosted the conference in Philadelphia. And uh, this was before we knew at ACA that we were going to actually engage on a strategic planning process. We, we knew this was something that would happen down the road. But when you and I met, you actually gave one of our pre-conference seminars that I thought was beautiful because it was about um, how do you engage a board and <laughs> different processes around strategic planning or getting your board on board. And I remember very distinctly about this conversation because I think you told me, you said, hmm, normally I work either with the board or with the staff. And in this particular, um, on this particular pre-conference, you had about equal measure of staff and board. And you said, well, this is going to be exciting and we'll see how this goes. We will host it at the wonderful Pew offices where Melissa is and she was our steward for the day and, and accompanied you. And um, it was amazing. I only sat in on part of it, but I remember that the feedback that we got from participants, which were all ACA members at the time, former uh, ACA board members, ACA staff. We had um, leaders from all around holding both board members as well as people who were actually working on the front lines. And they said that was the most dynamic workshop they had been to and they had learned so much about it. And so when it came to time for us to put together the strategic planning process, you were immediately on my short list to say, I'd love to hear Jennifer's thoughts um, on engaging on this process. So with that, I want you to just share a little bit about how we connected. And, and I guess I want to say to this, because I think everyone thinks that when you pick, pick, pick a strategic planning consultant, that it is all about, oh, we pick you. But it's as much as you picking us, right? <laughs> you, it, it, there's some reciprocity in that relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what you think about that and, and how how this matched up in your eyes and how you saw this unfolding. OK, 
Okay, well, I can talk. I think it does go right back to the the conference and that session and how impressed. I think I'm going to use that word how impressed I was by the Alliance community and how board and staff expressed tensions between board and staff, but also a great sense of community. And I fell in love with that. And I love that a couple of times during the session, a, a particular person was struggling and, and, and other people in the session stepped up and said, oh no, this is how we see you. This is how we can support you. So you were halfway down um, the path just from that, that session. The other piece that I really appreciated was that, Lisa, you and I were in the same place. And I think you were speaking for others um, and that were in conversation, but we knew that the strategic plan we bought turned out to be true, but we thought the strategic planning process was going to be messy, mm -hmm. non-linear, mm -hmm. iterative, a growth opportunity for individuals and collectively. So mm -hmm. I appreciated that. That's who I want to work with. That's where I want to engage, not a process that says, I'm the ED, I'm going to write this over the weekend, and then let's figure out how to get by from others. You said, let's invite people to this nonlinear, messy, iterative process, and how can we make sure that we truly engage people? So that's why I chose you. Yeah, yeah. Me. yeah. And I appreciate that because I really feel like we, you know, as, it, as most executive directors know on this call, when you're engaging a consultant, there's the conversations you have with the committee, and then there's the conversations you have with the consultant, right? And, and I think that is the truth of um, how we live. We, we may hold all these multiple identities, but sometimes that contradiction, contra contradiction um, it, it's there and you hold it, and then you have to kind of navigate through that. How did not only our conversations, but I, I remember when you were introduced to the um, to Sanji and then to the further the strategic visioning committee, how did that start to unfold? How did that match up? Was I clear? Was I accurate? Was, was I off base? What did you learn before and after those conversations um, as we went through this process? I think you were clear and accurate. I think that Others had their own sense of, of truth and, and dynamic of the community. And, and as you were reading um, David, the, the quotes from David White, I think you said, growth changes in something that surprises us. Mm -hmm. So I think there were surprises. Mm -hmm. I think there were surprises by, from this, uh, the core visioning committee, that was important, right? That was the first introduction, having a core visioning committee that was um, maybe five or six people who, who agreed to help communicate the process both ways. Mm. Um, and I think that part, that was one of our messy parts, right? What is the role of this committee? What does it really mean? We all agreed on what that sentence was. But how did that play out in reality was really the question. What does that mean, communicate? What does it mean to be the liaison? What does it mean to listen to the board and explain to the board what's happening in a way that people understand, people agree with, and people have an opportunity to change and evolve and surprise us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Jennifer, just to kind of go with that a little bit longer too, when I think about this, you know, we started, I think this was early 2019 that we started the strategic planning process. And, and to be honest- May like, yeah, 2019. Was it May 2019? And yeah. then we started this conversation, but we spent quite a bit of time as, as a visioning committee and also one-on-one -on -one on really refining that process and really working on that two-way communication. Can you talk a little bit from why that was important to you and, and what that would eventually yield? What, what kind of environment or climate would that make for us to be successful in this work? The, the, the classic elements of strategic planning are have a board retreat or two, right? have a survey, 
have stakeholder interviews. You know, so the classic pieces are there, but they weren't going to look the way I might have imagined that they were going to look. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be. I, I don't, I, I have 30 years of experience. I know that those pieces in some ways will be there. It has to be customized to the group, or I should even say it differently. It has to completely change to reflect the group. Because engagement, engagement was the key word and engagement in a way that everyone needed to be, to claim their agency, they needed to speak up and they needed to be listened to and they needed to be heard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the, that was the piece. So the, the visioning committee said, well, here's the process and that changed. Right? It changed and evolved, but started with the conversation of here's a process that we think might best truly engage people. And it took advantage of some standing moments, right? some standing board meetings, uh, and the conference was a, a standing piece again that October. And then we created moments along the way. Mm. 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 Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, Mario, I want to bring your voice into this conversation because it's interesting as I, as I take this walk back, Jennifer and I, this started, we actually had a different board chair and that person, not only did they come to the end of their board term um, to their, as, as chair, but they also rolled off of the board at that particular point, kind of midway through. And then Mario, you assumed the role of, of board chair. And I, I think for me, as I was thinking through this today, I was like, you kind of inherited this process. Um, and as an outside person to it, I, I think there were some things that you probably noticed that were incredibly wonderful, but you also probably noted a few things that needed strengthening. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks Thanks for that. And thanks to everybody who's on the call. Really appreciate this. Um, yes, yeah, so as coming in as a board chair, I have been obviously a board member member and so I've been involved in a lot of conversations and listening um, to the conversations that Jennifer was leading. And so, you know, kind of stepping back as the board chair to make sure all the processes were moving ahead in a smooth and productive way for the organization in the field. Um, I started to look at this work in light of everything else that was going on. There were major changes going on in the direction of the organization and looking at the importance of conference, whether we continue with conference. Um, the same time we were looking at uh, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are really forefront in our mind. And so it was a, a wonderful process. I, I think at sometimes Jennifer with your, with your process, I, I would end a board meeting and be, it would be so vast. And I, now I know your methodology, but it would be so vast. I would like, what, what do I hang on to in this area or this area? But then after we expanded the net, so to speak, as broadly as we can, then we started to pull it in to determine what was most important. You know, and it's funny, all of us are running organizations trying, I think most of us are running organizations are part of organizations trying to, trying to get by, trying to succeed, trying to operate in this new time and especially the impact of COVID. So we're all just, you know, it's hard to say what's going to happen the next few years, three years, five years, whatever that period is. However, I think it's important not to get stuck on that, but to think about what values are the most important to you as a body and your organization. What is it that grounds you, that is a center as your core of your being? And I think that, you know, for me, the issue of values comes very strongly. And I think we spend a lot of time and finally we're honing down on this, on our strategic plan that actually incorporates the values we want to see come to pass. They may not be in existence right now, but there's something that we value and we want to build on. And we want to take the lead in the field to support all of you, but also really, you know, have that as an aspirational goal for us. So as I came in, that's that's where I, I took over after Esther, wonderful Esther uh, Grimm left as chair, and I got to start overseeing the culmination of the strategic plan. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. And Mario, one of the things that, um, it's funny, there are a couple of things I, I keep up um, on, on my bulletin board behind my, my computer that you all can't see is that, there were a couple of things that Jennifer brought forward 
pretty early in the process. And, and a lot of this was around board engagement. I remember we completed a board survey where it wasn't about evaluating the work, um, my work as ED, but it was really looking thoughtfully at the capacity of the board. And it, you know, that that's part of that nonlinear that we're saying, like, because, you know, holding up a mirror to thine self is always, it, David White was saying, I was listening to him today, he says, you know, if we said to other people or our friends what we say to ourselves when we look in the mirror, it would be quite <laughs> horrible, right? Like it's this moment of holding up the mirror to the board itself. But also we had this thing that happened with the green zone and the red zone. And then the other side of it is how do we partner with the executive director? How does the board partner with the executive director? So these two things existed, but as board chair, because we're partners, you and I are really, really uh, close in this, you also have to play a different role in negotiating, communicating, and translating that for individual board members who may just be in a different part of the journey. Because right. like you said, we're living very different lives. We've got a lot on our mind. Many folks are going through the same exact process in some other part of their life where they're like, I can't do another strategic planning process. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you negotiated the relationships with your board colleagues uh, just to, to manifest the spirit of, I don't even want to say patience, um, but to stay in a, in a really uh, questioning and an emergent state of mind to, to manage through this. Yeah, I mean, my whole view is that, you know, if you're working on projects that the board itself does not understand, you should not move forward to try to explain something you don't understand to the rest of the membership. And so it's really important, I think, as, as a board chair to allow the board members to have their doubts, to have their questions, to have their confusion, and to really dive deeply into those discussions and listen and listen and listen so that you can continue to move the process forward, but at the same time, not disregarding or leaving off important board members that need to understand absolutely what it is you're doing and the goals and the why of what you're doing. So that would, that's, that's the methodology that I would use. But I also wanted to add, Lisa, without going on too much, is like, you know, I, was, I, I first started participating in this field um, at, in some residency programs in San Francisco when I was at the Yerba Buena Center almost 30 years ago. And then as time has gone on, I've become closer and closer to this field and ultimately chairing this board. And one thing I love about this field, and I think is, is, is manifest a bit in our strategic plan, is that this field is about creation. This field is about taking risk. This field is about allowing artists to do things that other people may have skepticism about whether they can get it even done or, or conceptualized. And I love that spirit of, the, of this field. And I think that we looked upon the strategic plan as an opportunity in these very, very changing and challenging times to, to step out and to be aspirational, to be strongly aspirational. And you're seeing that in the language that we have. Will everyone agree? No. Will everyone be 1000% in sync? No, and I never look for that. But I do think it is a role of an organization like this, especially leading a field like this, so creative, so important um, that you do take those chances, take those risks. And as the strategic plan outlines, the plan is to review this plan every few years to make sure it's on target, to make sure it's relevant, to make sure that it still speaks to what we really want to value. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Mario. That was really, really uh, quite beautiful. And I really appreciate what you're saying is to listen, to listen, to listen, and not to dismiss an individual because they don't agree or avoid an individual because you may not understand their point of view. I mean, that's the hard work of translation and building relationships and how we mirror that as a as, as boards and organizations shows up how we mirror that to our external communities as well. So thank you for that. I, I really do appreciate that. Um, Melissa, I, I wanna get your voice into this conversation. And um, just because I, I think we're painting a really beautiful picture of the, of the arc of engagement. And as I mentioned on your introduction is that, you know, I've known you for several years. I, I used to be on the Alliance board, even though it was my tenure was relatively short. And, and, and this is to the audience, make no mistake your relationship as a board member. And then when you transfer to an executive director, they're not uh, equal. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not an equal ship. As a board member, you know one thing, and as an executive director, you know lots of other things. Um, so I don't take that for granted that uh, there are certain members on this board that have been with me through that transition and how our relationships have evolved 
uh, by virtue of that. But Melissa, I wanted to speak to you a little bit because in uh, one of our recent conversations, you 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 told me some things that quite honestly just moved me, and um, they moved me in some really deep and, and special and important ways. I think on a day that I I needed to be moved. Um, can you talk a little bit about about the transformation you've seen over the past five or six years um, within the context of ACA and within the context of the organization? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the points that got there and, and highlight that. Um, I, I don't remember everything about that conversation, Lisa, but I remember we had a, a really um, deep conversation that day. Um, I, I think that watching um, the organization shift, you know, has been really interesting for me. Um, I think that as a board, we went through anti-oppression training, mm -hmm. which was a huge um, step to take. And I think a really important step before embarking on the strategic plan. I think it um, got us all into a a certain place in our minds to be able to um, tackle the strategic plan. Um, but I think for me personally, it's been watching this, sh your evolution as a leader and mm -hmm. watching how knowing you as a, uh, you know, a person and a colleague and a fellow board member coming into the Alliance and, um, uh, you know, just watching how you've really led this organization in a new direction, in a really courageous direction. And I've just found it very inspiring. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about, I, just to remind you a little bit about that conversation, is that we did start um, with anti-oppression training first. I remember maybe it was my second or third board meeting and we kind of started to outline some agenda for the future. And Mario, I always believe, I believe it was you said that, you know, you would love to participate in some type of anti-oppression and anti-racism training in the board, uh, energetically and, and thoughtfully engaged in that. I said, yes, we should. And I, I, I think it was as, as soon as maybe my fifth or sixth month uh, in my leadership role, that we brought in y, YK Hong to lead us in a year long journey around that. And, and it was important um, for all of us, right? No, we were all at very different starting points and had very different experiences, but it was something that we needed to codify. And Melissa, when you and I were talking and, and we were chatting a couple of weeks ago, uh, you talked and, and spoke very beautifully about how this not only impacted uh, your service and, and your work within the context of the Alliance of Artist Communities, uh, but also in your personal work. And I, they were, that just resonated me in so many ways because you as a professional, your personal life, uh, as a volunteer board member with ACA, what, how that actually shows up and, and talking about how it threaded throughout all those relationships and the impact it had. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that change uh, that you went through? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I, I guess I should probably start by saying that I'm a deeply shy person. I'm really a, a major introvert. And so being asked to be vulnerable in my public, in my professional self was really a challenge for me. Um, and I think that going through the anti-oppression training just pushed every discomfort button in my body. It was really, really, really hard for me. Um, and, but it was also really eye-opening. I remember the first time that YK put up the um, list of the characteristics of white supremacy culture. And I remember looking at that list and thinking like, wow, that's everything I know that's what I've been brought up in. And there's been a lot of it that I had always bristled against, but didn't really quite understand. And so that was a, a big aha moment for me. And, and I have, I, I was starting from, you know, really probably um, um, ground zero with all of this stuff. Um, and then I also realized that, you know, I'm, because of everything that's been going on in the country over the last year and a half, we've been going through our own DEI um, experience and training at our office. We went through anti-oppression, uh, anti-racism training at the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, and we're still working on that. And I'm part of that, the committee that's um, trying to lead that internally. And it was really 
there were moments that were really challenging for me when other staff members would say things. I realized that who I think I am and what I represent to other people are different. And I had to do a lot of trying to like not be defensive, trying not to take it personally and stepping back. And there were moments I had a lot of sleepless nights. There were some things said that were really uncomfortable. And at one point I reached out to YK actually to ask her if she did like personal coaching. And she and I did um, sessions together and that was completely just something I did personally. Um, and so it's just really, I think all of this work with um, the board of the Alliance, I have to say, I, I've been really privileged to be part of this community and this organization during this time. And I think the one thing with our strategic plan that has been really important is the trust and transparency that we have as a board um, and you know the building of relationships. So I could talk to Lisa about some of this stuff and, and, and feel comfortable revealing my discomfort and my own, um, the ways I fell down along the way. Um, so anyway, it's just really been, um, I think about it every single day, I think about what are the structures I'm involved in, what are the systems I'm involved in, how am I implicated and how can I change and allow for other voices to come forward and how do I support that? Yeah, yeah, and I, I just thank you for that, Melissa, because um, having gotten to know you over the past five or six years, I recognize what this means to share your story in this moment. Um, and then understanding also that uh, it is really important when we talk about anti-oppression, when we talk about anti-racism training, when we talk about building the equitable capacity of our organizations, when we talk about strategic planning, that often we look to the outside of self, right? We look way beyond uh, the org, we say the organization, and then somehow we forget we are agents of the organization. We look out to the community that we want to help, that we're going to save. We think about the programs and we think about everyone else, but bringing the individual into the process is what makes the strength of the process. And I think, you know, for me as executive director of ACA, I get to say is that I work with a group of individuals that have brought their whole selves to this. Uh, we are, as like any other board organization, we have our challenges, we have the areas that need strengthening, we have questions to answer. But the one thing that has kept me so inspired throughout this process is that we have individuals that are willing not only to point out uh, the deficits of everyone else, right? So it's easy to say what the ED should be doing, what the staff should be doing, what the field should be doing, and, but versus holding up that mirror to themselves and saying, what can I do? What, what, how am I showing up in this moment? And that has been really quite beautiful. And I just wanna thank you for, for being an example of that um, um, and beyond being beyond an ally to be truly in solidarity with this work because uh, that, that means a lot to me. And I, and I think it's a beautiful example for this board so, um, and this community. So thank you for that. Um, Sanji, hi Sanji. Sanji uh, and I, uh, I, 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 I love everyone and I love my whole board, but we have some similar characteristics on certain things that uh, we, we like to fly fish. Uh, we are terribly hard to get on a calendar and get scheduled for a meeting or a one-on-one. -on -one. And we have really interesting children that uh, keep us challenged and play tricks on us at a random <laughs> time. We often share that conversation, which I think makes it really easy for us to talk. And when we get together to make those conversations, not just uh, we make the best use of our time together. Um, I, I, there are a couple of things I want to talk to you about, Sanji, but the, there's, I don't, I don't actually even know where to start. Um, but I'm, I'll start with this one because Jeffrey is on this call and, and I want to talk about what this means because there were two things that kind of really brought and codified our leadership around where we were going with this plan, planet. And I, 
I remember two things. One, that everyone says a strategic plan is something that you just, you do it and then you put it up on the shelf and you actually don't ever revisit until it's time to do the next strategic plan. Like this is one thing that we were like, oh no, we can't do that. And then I remember when Jeffrey said to us uh, as we were forming the strategic visioning committee and he, and we all were talking about, we wanted to be something different. We had heard this from our board members. We heard this from the community. We heard this from Alliance, uh, artist communities members, we heard this from artists, from our different funders. And Jeffrey said to us, well, if we wanna be something different, why don't we start calling ourselves something different? So we went from a strategic planning committee to a strategic visioning committee. And I felt like that was a really important inflection point. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that meant for you, how it began to show up and the questions we were asking and also how we moderated these conversations between Jennifer, me, you, the visioning committee, the board, and also our external community? Sure, I can try it. I feel like you're asking me to define the universe and give three examples. So I'm gonna try to like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do yeah, that. Not, but, but, but first and foremost, I'll start off by saying, a, a, you know, I, I, the bond that I have with Lisa, you, it, it's just phenomenal. And so I've, I've always appreciated our rapport and our, our candor, and I have to say that I really extend that also to the board and to the staff uh, of the alliance, I, the um, the arts communities alliance. I, I really like. I have to say, that just uh, what remarkable peers and colleagues to to go ahead and embark upon a journey like this. Um, I think that uh, Lisa, you had mentioned earlier that you know, kind of going beyond the traditional cookie cutter sixty month strategic plan, which really the easiest thing for an ED and for a board is to go ahead and do something that's pretty, uh, pretty formulaic and just put it on a shelf and check, you know, dust it off once a year. Um, but, uh, and I hate to use this cliche of looking at this as a living document, but I, but I will here. I think the goal and that, that transition to planning and divisioning, I think opened up the doors pre-pandemic, pre so many other occurrences that have occurred that in some ways this document is so much more relevant now than it was even uh, when it was drafted three months ago or four months ago. Um, I would say that for me, it really is a living document. And I think that visioning impetus is really what I think helped instigate uh, that living document quality about it. Um, the important aspect here, I think, that exists within the plan and its form through, through its um, incubation through the, a visioning process um, is really the fact that it's accountable to everyone, um, that, that this plan creates an accountability structure that's not merely towards the board, um, but really that, that uh, anyone here that are, that are members, this is a, this is a document in a, footprint, in a blueprint, uh, which uh, we're accountable to all of you. And, and I think that stems directly from this idea of visioning. Mm -hmm. Mm, thank you for that, Sanji. And and Jeffrey, can I call on you? I I know you're on. Hi, Jeffrey. Um, I, I wanted to and uh, I'm going to give you a second so Ewish can unmute you. Um, but there was one something, and this is a very specific thing. But um, aside from all the thoughtful notes, uh, the reminder to breathe and meditate and hold space, um, the beautiful like I get on my IG and uh, it'd be something beautiful, rest sister, you know, the things that one needs to be held in a process. Um, Jeffrey, you offered up something very specific to us. And I think this kind of really goes in alignment with the Sanji said about being accountable to not only the board or the staff, but to everyone on this call, the field and, and the sector writ large is when we got down to this thing that we look at these strategic plans and we start saying, what are our KPIs? What are our key performance indicators? What are our qualitative, you know, quantitative metrics around that? And you offered up something so beautiful that just, that I, that I can't get out of my heart. And it is just like conditions of satisfaction. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, this is Jeffrey, he's also on our board and I reminded board members that they would be called on randomly. So Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> I am immediately feeling resonance and deep connection with uh, Melissa's offering and share of being a shy and introverted person. <laughs> so I've been invited to, uh, to move into a different space. Um, 
what I remember the most about that offering around conditions of satisfaction um, is really at the level of feeling. What I could feel from us as a board body is a lot of tightness and not a lot of movement around, like as we got to the place of really um, fixing language and things became more concrete, moving from a place of visioning to a place of planning. Planning is important, vision is also important. Often in a planning process, we leave the visioning and it's just about planning. Mm. So when we got to a place of really fixing language, moving from visioning to planning, and we started to talk around key performance indicators, the thing that felt true to me in the moment is that there was a fear and a tenderness about losing the humanity that had been a part of the process. And if it's true, and I believe that it is, that we are human in systems and not machines, then the more human language that we use to define and describe the things that we are doing, the better able we are to embody uh, the world that we're longing for. So conditions of satisfaction came into our conversation as an offering in that way. And how it came into my life is um, at that time, I was working with uh, a coach. Um, I had lost a friend, I had lost my grandfather. So there was a lot of personal sorrow and sadness in my life at that time. Um, and all of the things that shape us are a part of the processes we were a part of. So it was just something that was always there with me in process and in the room. And conditions of satisfaction, like a couple of weeks before that, was something my coach and I were working on. She could see in my attempts to, uh, to like get back on track and you know all the kinds of, again, machinic language that we use about the world. She could see me struggling. And the invitation was to just acknowledge, first to vision and then to acknowledge what might be satisfying. If we don't know what would be satisfying, then we are not satisfiable. We won't get anywhere. So really leaning into that and offering that back to the group was uh, that's that's what I was up to in that moment was bringing in my life into our process mm. so that we could get free together. Get free together. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Jeffrey. And I think the yeah. other part of that is Jennifer uh, and Sanjeev uh, going to both of you on this is that we really did work on this idea of freeing ourselves from these prescriptive um, jargon terms. Uh, we, I, I think Sanjeet, you told me you had gone through the document and you looked for some of the words that are often overused, such as diversity, equity. Um, there's probably community and that being a part of our name was even a, a stretch in itself. And I, I really loved it. And, and some of folks on this call might think that was a bit weedy when you, when you pointed out how many times we use specific words. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I do. I feel like it, it showed my, it showed the geeky part of me in a whole new way. Um, <laughs> but, but I mean, I think that the, the broader point here is oftentimes, and I think so many of us are in it. And I have to say, that's what's so remarkable about, about my colleagues on the board is that, um, that we're all, we're all in this, we're all invested in this work in different ways. And, uh, and we're all really kind of co-thought partners. Uh, but from my perspective, the emphasis here was not on this kind of cookie cutter notion of symmetry. It was, it was actually about balance over symmetry. I think that there's in many ways kind of strategic asymmetry within this document. Um, it's not expecting the fact that things balance out and that things kind of simply resolve itself on a PL statement. And that's, and that's where this world exists. I would say this this document, if anything, really kind of embraces um, the power um, the power of balance over symmetry in a world which is consistently trying to say that it can solve or or try to try to go ahead and answer through problems by saying everything just needs to be balanced. And anyways, and so that's that's in part what I think that that language scrubbing comes into is to go ahead and feel like that we can eradicate these these shelf words that don't, that really become these convenient terms that allow us to not really say what we really mean. Yeah. 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 Jennifer, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, I wanna add a couple of things. And I think the conversations up till now are, are, are really illustrating one of them. I believe that the wisdom's in the room. 
And, and sometimes the wisdom in the room says we need to enlist others, right? Mm -hmm. But what I mean by that is, yes, I agree, Sanjeet, you've said it. I think this board is extraordinary, but it's extraordinary because every single person contributed to this plan in a very deep way, right? We can point to Jeffrey as an example, just we said, we can point to conditions of success because of what he brought to the table. So, so I, as we're, we're sort of celebrating the strategic plan, I want to make sure that people know that that can happen in other places. It's not just because of this, the Alliance has an extraordinary board. I think every board is extraordinary when we engage and, and when I am challenged, because I can get geeky in my own way, right? And like, put down the thesaurus, Jennifer, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and, and say profound things in a simple way. Mm -hmm. so in a simple way that is fresh and, and isn't just the buzzword of the day or the month of the year, because then it becomes, you know, it becomes something that feels it's like candy, right? Feels good for that second. And then wait, what was that? You know, it's, it's short, but it to buzz for a second. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's really important. And then to speak to the balance um, and, and thank you, Sanji, for lifting that up because balance was one of the words that I used to try to remember. I, I felt like I was the guide to, to have the, the balance or the intersection of where people were. So we have the, those who are super concrete on the board who, and task oriented. We have those who are very abstract and visionary, right? The, the place where we sit well is the intersection of that. Mm. And it changes, right? The balance is something that is, is not stationary too. It's ever changing. Mm. So those are a couple of thoughts. Yeah, Jennifer, thank you for bringing that forward because I also feel like that's that's my experience as well is understanding and I and I do think over the past five years being in relationship with this board going through anti oppression training. Um, for how we have learned and grown together to put us in a position to do this. Um, it, it's good to know that when you can go through the list of your board members and have some idea about the relationship that they hold, the questions that they may ask, um, the things that they are a little bit more particular about versus someone else. But I really do feel like that contributed to a successful process because then it wasn't about, to Mario's point, avoiding or discarding their needs. It was more about extending an invitation to them into the process and making sure we had something that was thorough, that was something that was accessible. And going back to a word that we fell on a lot, uh, that we were precise, precise in our language. So avoiding jargon that may be very specific to us in one context, but might be something that was totally uh, out of a realm for someone else. I, I, had a, I remember having a conversation with the staff throughout this process. And one of the things that Ed Weege challenged us to doing with uh, being um, a, a person, and Ed Weege, I hope you're okay with me disclosing this, where English is, is not their first language, uh, the importance of looking at words, even such as international, right? Looking at your positionality and how you talk about it. So uh, being very clear that that's all respected to the context that you're in and knowing that we have board members that are not just centered here in the US, that we have member programs that are not here, that we had to break down that barrier and make ourselves a little bit more more porous versus in that in a some way, decentering our geography. And that, that kind of precision requires constant, constant interrogation. Why are you saying it this way? Why are you doing this? Why would this work? I always, I remember that January board meeting before the pandemic broke and after Craig had ho hosted us at Abrams and it was beautiful and we all left on cat cloud nine. It was the last weekend in January. And I had read to you all, David White, and we talked about where David White said that um, the beautiful question shapes the beautiful mind, but really thinking about how we can build a culture of, inter culture of interrogation within the context of the Alliance 
at that moment, I got to get better at using ACA. I am failing big time on this, but I'm going to get there, <laughs> get, building that culture of interrogation within the context of artist communities and saying, how, can, how might we do this better? And Sanjeev, I'm just going to bring you back into this conversation for that, because the last thing we did, which one might think is the first thing when did, we landed uh, on our mission. And, and we had a very beautiful and, and thoughtful discussion over several uh, board meetings about what the mission would be. And, and we landed on something a little bit different. Um, Sajid is uh, still on mute. There we go. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um... I, you know, I have to say, I, I think that the conversations that we had with the board about ad about adopting a mission um, that's framed as a question, I think you're going to stay with me for for years because I think they were very, they were very thoughtful. They were very, um, there was a very intense series of conversations, and I think because the goal was to make sure that that this shift was not gimmicky. Um, it wasn't seen as um, is um, almost trying to say, let's, let's just do something that feels like other organizations aren't doing, but really rather that it was heartfelt and reflective. Um, you know, for me, I, I, I guess I, I've got a personal inclination towards questions because I think it both, my, my love of poetry is another thing that maybe Lisa and I have in common too, but for me, I'm, I'm a sucker for one, if there's one book of poetry that I'm grabbing, you know, um, uh, out the door, it's it's Pablo Neruda's book of questions, which he was published after he died, published in 1974, and it's a a series of sonnets um, that are inherently unanswerable. You know, there are these questions that are inherently unanswerable, and in some ways, I think there's a real reflection that 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 this organization is an aspirational organization. Um, it's never going to get to perfection. It's a constant process of dialogues, and I think it takes a certain degree of humility um, and generosity um, to say our mission is not to say we're really cool, um, but rather to say um, we want to strive to answer the following. And we know it's a lifelong process that, that this organization is part of that journey. So I do think um, ideally this represents a degree of precision, precision intentfulness, humility, but also the, the 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 goal is to say what's your question what's your question that supplants this what's your question that we tag on to this um, and, and in some ways just in preparation for in preparation for this conversation was to see all of the questions that many of you had asked um, as to be part of this dialogue and in some ways they all they are all interconnected and, and fit in together yeah 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 thank you thank you um, I, I, I just hold that I, re, I remember that conversation, I, like you, Sanjay, it is one of those conversations that'll stay with me literally, I, I think, forever. Um, and, and I remember, Craig, because you're, you're on this call, you sent me a beautiful note afterwards. Um, and it, I, I, if I, I, I often talk about being held and cradled and someone's holding me and they don't even know they're doing it, but Craig really uplifted in that moment. And, you know, Craig, what did you feel in that moment of, of having that as the center of our conversation? What was the shift of that going, of us moving from looking at the task, looking at the, just getting it done to moving to a space that, that we were actually starting to live in our own transformation at that moment? That's, such a, that's a big question, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, I did send you a note one night. I was, I, I um, and I can't exactly remember uh, what moved me specifically in that moment, other than to say that, you know, I think strategic planning processes and these kinds of activities are, um, you know, you go through these periods where you're like, is this, what is this? What, you know, is this working? Like, I, I don't understand what we're doing right now. Like, there were moments where I, you know, I, I genuinely felt confused and Jennifer often said, you know, like, just roll with it, keep going, you know, and, and um, I think we had come out on the other side of it feeling, I came out on the other side of it feeling, this is going to sound corny, but just feeling much closer to everybody because it felt, um, it felt like we had really coalesced around a, 
a set of really important values. And I think I reached out to you at that moment, Lisa, because I was just so impressed by all of these disparate threads that had suddenly felt like they were, you know, floating in the wind had suddenly woven together in this really phenomenal way, going all the way back to doing the DEI work early on. Um, and kind of just feeling incredibly impressed by your, you know, having gone through this many, many months long process of arriving on the other side of it thinking, wow, did she know that that's how, I, did she know that, like, that we were gonna get to this really incredible place? And I gave you the benefit of the doubt and said, yes. And so that's why I sent you a note. <laughs> so kind, but uh, definitely not so, I didn't, I, like everyone else was going through this process with no idea where we would land, um, but hopeful and receptive to the invitation. And I, I also, uh, I had a friend once and I referenced this, um, uh, maybe I was talking with our executive committee recently or, or Jennifer or this planning group. Uh, and she, she was a colleague and at the time was leading a, a, a service organization. And she talked about doing the strategic plan over the weekend. And she had gone home and kind of put down the benchmarks and so forth. And one of the things for me that really resonated and was, was really super important is that this was going to be a high contact, high, high contact strategic plan, that it was not something that we would do in a vacuum. It wasn't about advancing my individual goals as, as a human. I had some insights based on experiences, but at the end of the day, it was our it was our plan to manifest uh, and to get as many voices into that as possible. And that felt really important. So I'll, now, Craig, I'm going to take you off the spot and put one, uh, one of my team members on the spot, Deb. <laughs> going to ask you to unmute uh, because one of the questions that has come in is like, how was the staff involved in this process? And, and I, I think uh, sometimes um, this feels like the really invisible side of the work is, is this is the work that the staff does and I'd love to hear a little bit of your perspective and, and the participation um, and what you gleaned from it. Um, yes, and sorry, switching gears here from responding to uh, chats from participants here. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think for from my perspective, the process was pretty beautiful because the strategic plan as it evolved sort of reflected the work that we've been doing for a couple of years. Um, and while I don't think it prescribed the work, it helped to capture all of the thinking and values that have been going into this work. Excuse me. But then I think it also um, guides the work that we've been doing too. So I know that when we have questions about um, a particular direction for a program, we bring it back and Advish is the best at bringing up the strategic plan again of like having that answer to our questions, helping guide us. Yeah, yeah. And Jennifer came and spent some time with us. Uh, we did a day long workshop with Jennifer. Um, there was a number of different audits. Flannery, you'll remember this and pulling together information and, and the history of how we were doing things and doing different things. Uh, but also there was, Flannery, I'm gonna ask you, also was the important part of bringing in um, our external community into this as well and, and finding those moments. You could just- Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just got the message that my internet is unstable, so we'll see. <laughs> this goes. Um, yeah, you know, so much of our work always is um, as Lisa has talked about, is always coming back to the table and making sure that we're engaging and that we're really in conversation with our members and um, giving a lot of opportunities to hear from our members and hear um, what, they're, what they're feeling, how they're doing this work um, in the strategic plan, sort of a, an anchor um, phrase has been the pe people who power residencies. And so throughout this, that was sort of like, how are we hearing from you know folks who work with residencies at every level in leadership, you know folks who are actually on the ground working with artists, development, communications, um, artists? How are we hearing from all the different sectors of the field and really creating the room for them to come and and sort of be part of this conversation? So from day one, that was really centered. 
Thank you, Flannery. And Edwige, I know you're off camera, but I'm gonna invite you into this part too, because for many of you that know this, uh, at the same time of doing our strategic planning, going through our strategic planning process, we are also in the process of building out a new website that's happening uh, on the separate platform. But also, we also have uh, uh, freshened, uh, renewed our brand identity. So with a new name, um, the strategic plan, uh, a clarified mission, we have uh, com come forward with a, a whole new way of being. and. One of the things that we that I that I really loved, and this showed up. I don't know if it was timing. I don't know if you did this by design. I don't know what how, how this happened, but when we were going through the strategic visioning process, we were also going through shaping the ideas around our brand brand identity with work order and. We had a lot of questions, but those questions really helped us. Uh, they became really meaningful information and data. Can you talk a little bit about that part of the process? Sure. Um, I think that my, um, well, I think the foundation that you laid out around board engagement, having that deep reservoir of trust having been established, um, having a willing group of board members as well as staff being willing to engage in a process without a predetermined outcome, created these opportunities for us to um, have parallel tracks of work happening and to have them converged when they needed to. And so um, I appreciated having the opportunity to uplift that there was this moment to not only be able to think about the platform shifting with what where we wanted to go, but that um, our investment both in technology and our branding, that that was all part of the strategic move, right? That it, it wasn't five years from now, we'll think about redoing the logo or, you know, and, you know, case in point, right? We renamed ourselves. We changed our name within the logo process. We did not go into that process with the intention. And, and I just want to, again, credit everyone who was on staff, everyone who's on our board, being willing to have um, an open posture to receive information and to see it as an opportunity rather than to be defensive and having to defend what we had done or that it, it all became, um, what I've been telling the team is that we as, a, as an organization were willing to engage in a process that we support, which is a creative process, right? Like, we, we created this opportunity for us to do what we're supporting, the work that we're supporting, which is artists being able to freely experiment, research, take part in a deep experience in the creative process. And so what I think worked really, really well in this process was this moment when we did away with the expectations of how we were supposed to do this work, right? In all the ways that this work could be prescribed, uh, prescriptive. And we, you know, within reason said, let's throw it out and let's recreate it. And, and um, what I will also say is that um, there were many willing participants to do all of that labor, to hold, to uplift, right? To steward um, And that, Jennifer, you spoke on this, right? That there was a deep level of engagement and commitment from every person involved, right? This wasn't gonna rest with the vision committee. This wasn't gonna rest with staff, that everyone, um, not only brought their expertise, but brought their whole self, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Irish. Um, Kira was on this call earlier, and I was going to uh, strategically uh, call on Kira to talk about how that supported our brand identity work being involved at that time in the process. But maybe that's one of our follow-ups um, that we can write about and talk about. Hey, Tam, uh, I, I want to call on you. Uh, and I want to ask you as our treasurer to talk about how the strategic plan supports our financial work and, and the work that we're doing and, and, and really being good stewards of, 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 of our fund development, but keeping us on track, but also the discipline that's brought to that. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting um, because the finance, finances of an organization or the the audit process you have to go through, all of that is, is so um, embedded in a structure that 
uh, well, I would say a white colonial structure. So it was very difficult to sort of look at us wanting to do a strategic plan that was different and us to create an organization that was built differently um, in, in terms of a, a very rigid and structured finance committee. So it was, it was interesting to look at it and say, how can we do this differently, but still, you know, follow the rules and the laws that we that were that we have to abide by. Um, and so we did talk about, you know, where are the items within um, our budget that we need to make sure there is uh, support, financial support for activities, um, and putting in specific line items that that, um, you know, for using a, a, a term when when you measure it or you you measure it it's, it gets done right and so if you if you name it and you put it out there it, it it's a specific spot it's not embedded within professional development or not embedded within um, other other expenses and so um, you know we've started to do that I, I wouldn't say we're there yet but we've started to do that so um, it's it's now going to take I think a deeper dive into um, the strategic plan and say, okay, so here's where we're going. Here's what we want to do. How do we fund that? And how do we make it um, really explicit that that's what we're funding and that's what we want to do? Does yeah. that answer yeah. your question? That, that, that's perfect. I mean, um, you know, we hear so often where people say that your budget reflects your morals and it really feels quite satisfying to have a budget that reflects our strategic direction and, and the vision we wish to uphold. I mean, we've made some small, they, they seem small and slight, but even adding in a line on the budget sheet that talks about equitable capacity. So not, mm -hmm. not saying just about um, accessibility or veiling is just like, what are we doing to contribute to our, our to the growth of this organization becoming more equitable across all domains and having a pot that actually goes to support that as well as embodying it um, throughout the other line items. So um, I think the other two things that we did uh, or that we're in the midst of doing is, is those that we are engaging with on a consulting basis in terms of the financial uh, area are ones that we feel hold those values as well mm -hmm. so um you know uh we've done that and we're hoping to do that for our auditors when we when we move to a, a find a new auditing firm and just so you don't have to continue to have those battles and struggles when you're trying to explain you know what it is you do and 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 the money you're spending around doing that or get, or getting in in terms of that um i think is going to be a big relief um, but it's but it's definitely finding those entities that that hold the same values and and morals and that we want to uphold in the strategic plan. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the budget is a really important piece. I, I think some of the questions that we've seen come in and some of the things that that are an immediate follow up is we we were really clear about incorporating and making explicit in the strategic plan um, time for our, our staff to rest. And what does a condition of satisfaction look like for that? It's not just about adding more PTO to the bottom line, but really how do we as an organization function and work so that when one person on the team is taking time, maybe everyone's taking time so that you can really feel that relief of having time off, um, having time for planning, uh, planning is really important to have a successful organization. Uh, Jeffrey said this is like you have to transcend, you know, you have to leave that visioning state and actually get to the brass tacks of how you are actually going to do and over what time is that actually going to happen. And our strategic plan has been a really great guide for us to be able to hit these, these marks and hit different times of the year to say, hey, we need to sit back. Um, and we need to not only prepare for the budget next year, we need to actually plan for how we're going to actually get there and achieve those um, conditions of satisfaction. And we also believe in the power and believe deeply in evaluation and assessment. And these are some of those terms, again, that are rooted in white body superiority. Uh, supremacy that are often used and weaponized against bodies of culture uh, that me as a black woman leader I can bristle against but I really value having space to know that I can I can bring forward these ideas and indicators that are different from just saying 
oh, we checked a number of boxes on representation, we can do this, that we can actually get to a way of being as our indicator of success. We can get to a way of how we show up in the world. And that has been all thoughtfully guided by this uh, strategic plan. Uh, I, I remember Joseph Hall, you had a very specific question that came in and, and I wanted to talk about this and I think we'll, we'll end on this because we can never not talk about resource and fund development. And Jennifer, I'm gonna ask you to partner with me on this, this final question uh, for two reasons. Is that one, um, how do you leverage your strategic plan for funding? Um, that that was a that that's a really important question, and, and I probably should have been thinking about that question at the start, but I don't I wasn't because I figured if we were living our values, if we were living uh, not we we're not only expressing intention but really managing the impact that we would could be something different, and those people, those funders that were aligned with that would get on board and. Honestly, I think that has been the result of it in the six short, short weeks we have uh, had a, an incredible outpouring of support. But Jennifer, um, development is an area where you really thrive and are, uh, hold some level of not only wisdom and strong experience, but can you talk to us a little bit and some tips around that? So I think that I, I always try to conceive the strategic plan as an invitation as we've said several times throughout, but not specifically to the, the donors, the funders. And so I'm grateful for this question. I, I think it comes out in, in two ways. It's the, it's the clarity, right? Because, the, because it is the, the, precis, the precise language helps describe and articulate for a funder what the future direction might hold. I think clarity is hugely important. Right, funders, um, good funders even can only take so much time to really understand. You have to come to the table with a, a sense of direction and invite them to participate. I think that contrast is really important for funders. This is who we are now. This is who we are or hope to be. Um, Mario, you said aspiration. Sanjeet, you said aspiration. Um, that again is another invitation. With your resources, we can together go in this new direction, which is clear. It's 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 extraordinary, but it's not so abstract that they have no sense of that. I, I think it also, uh, um, and this is the putting the the board members. Um, this is part of the conversation we had in January. Their their roles as active ambassadors and advocates and um, and and fundraisers. Um, fundraisers um, look different depending on the organization. For, for the Alliance, it's about can you articulate as advocates to the field in a way that doesn't get bogged down in the details, but gets, gets people focused on how this, this organization is supporting a field. So I really appreciate that the plan can be a tool for fundraising on all these levels. Mm -hmm. Is that Thank helping, you. Lisa? That is, that is incredible. And I'm sure there's more to come on that, more to come. Tony, I see your hand is raised. Tony's another one of our board members. He's on our finance committee. Yes, thank you. Just unmuting myself. I'll just want to tack on quickly uh, as a board member, just a huge fan of this entire process, but to that question specifically, as a funder, and, and we have an application deadline this week for residencies to apply to us, we are just immensely drawn to residency programs and organizations that have a vision. I'm not looking for anyone's ideals to line up with, you know, some language on our application. We're looking for commitment to having a vision that, that shows as a residency, here's here's what we would like to see that, and to Jennifer's point, that's, that's different maybe than how things have been. We're identifying a lack of participation from communities that we would like to see. You know, frankly, it just, I, I love to see the messy language, the language that says that, and, and to Jeffrey's point earlier, the humanity, the tenderness, we're not looking for um, nuts and bolts. We're looking for you know this this what draws me to this field is that it's a field of of 
humanity of caretakers. And we're looking for how, how organizations can present themselves in ways that shows this deep commitment to making this field better. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, with that, I'd love to just say thank you to our wonderful panelists uh, and all my board members that are here, both uh, who have participated and who have not, but you have given more than a little bit to the creation of this uh, incredible strategic plan, which we're all very proud of. Um, and I think all of you for creating the culture of generosity that, that we hope to live and embody throughout our work. Um, there is still more work to be done. Uh, this is ongoing and it's lifelong and um, likely if we finish, it's the end of the world. So the good thing is that we'll always have uh, more work to do, but I challenge each one of you to join us in thinking about ways to create those environments where staff and artists can thrive and experience joy in their work. Uh, we must come back to that. We must remember that. We must hold that paramount because one doesn't exist without the other. You can't have unhappy staff and happy artists and happy artists and or unhappy artists and happy staff. So there's a there's work to be done here. And in the coming months, uh, Clayton, I think you asked this question as we our, our programming has been really laser targeted and bringing this and uplifting ways to do that through um, identity work, uh, through your uh, program design work, through fund and resource development, through how our stewardship processes and also how you operationalize that. So please just stay in contact with our uh, ongoing roster of upcoming residencies connect, uh, equitable capacity workshops and networking opportunities. And lastly, for any artists and any artists that you know that have participated in your program, the invitation is open. We welcome all artists. Uh, this is, they are central to our work. We center artists and they inform how we answer that question, that visionary question, that big question that we have, how can we, how might we inspire and unite the artist residency field. We can't do that without the artist voice. So I encourage each one of you to all of the artists that are in your networks and in your sphere and in your realm to come out and talk to us about that because this is they are, they're guiding this work right alongside with us. Uh, we wanna speak with them and co-construct, but not just uh, on behalf of. So I thank you all for your time. Give it up for our panelists. This was a beautiful conversation and we'll see you on the next one.